Thanks for staying with us. You may change your career due to two reasons, either loss of current job or dissatisfaction with the existing job. However, it is almost impossible to up and quit today and find a fantastic opportunity just waiting for you tomorrow. Changing your career requires a lot of deliberations. It can have a strong impact on your psychology while disrupting your finances. Career change may come with a loss of income, loss of financial benefits, unemployed phases, additional expenditure on courses, change in lifestyle, and so on. However, it is important to have that courage to make a change if you are unhappy with your job. So we are asking, how can we mitigate the financial implications that come with career transitioning? Please let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 081-803-84663. You could also tweet at us at WaysshowAfrica1 with the hashtag WaysShow. Hmm. Ladies, I would like to hear your thoughts about this, actually. And I want to start with Uti. So, Uti, yeah, so career transitioning, right? I think... Um, I think not enough, not enough people think about it. Not enough people think they can do it. Um, a lot of times people, in fact, funny enough that we're talking about this today, I was just watching a show earlier today um, and it just was a show that seemed to be full of people doing really interesting jobs. I mean, high pressure jobs, but really, really interesting jobs. And I was having a conversation with myself and I said, you know what, there are people out there doing amazing things. Yeah. And almost thinking to myself, oh, should I be doing something else or do I want to be doing something else? Um, and I find that these conversations, perhaps a lot of us don't stop to think about it because if you ask, probably, if you ask 10 people, probably at least six or seven, would tell you they'd rather be doing something else. But the taking the action towards doing something else usually is where the problem lies. People don't know where to start. They don't even, for some people, it doesn't even cross their radar that is possible. Mm. Um, and the fact that when you start to think about it, are you taking action? Are you properly looking at yourself, mm. assessing your skills? What transferable skills do you have? Because people think about going into a different industry and they're like, oh, you know, how can I go into this industry? I don't have any cognitive experience. Mm. But then sometimes it's not just, I mean, of course, in certain fields, yes, it is about having experience and having qualifications. I mean, you can't just pivot into being a doctor without getting the training. But for a lot of other um, skills and other career paths, right, uh, there are a lot of transferable skills that people just don't realize. So when we talk about, you know, the communication, the leadership, all of those things um, that really lend themselves to getting you on that path for um, for transitioning in your career. I think the other thing as well, which is the, the, the key part that we're talking about today is finances. People are thinking, do I want to jump out of the known where I'm safe, where, you know, I'm confirmed in a job? Do I want to jump, not just, you know, I mean, jumping into a new company is a risk in the same type of job, yeah. but then jumping into a completely new industry or completely different skill, right, is probably, you know, 10 times the risk. So people are thinking, do I want to, have that risk, do I want to take that risk, right? Um, so finances becomes a huge part of it. So people don't know how much they need to have saved. Do I need to have a year's salary? Do I need to have five years? Like, how much do I need to have? What is? What should I be thinking about from the financial side of it? Because most people just think, I don't want to put my, my income. Whether the income is enough or not is not the conversation. But the one that I have, I don't want to put it at risk, right? So um, I think that is a fantastic topic to be talking about. I've certainly got my pen and paper here, and I'm looking forward to <laughs> taking a few notes from our guests because, you know, no knowledge is wasted. Knowledge is power. Very true, yes. This is actually a very relatable topic for me. But then before before I, I give my thoughts, let's hear from NJ. NJ, what are your thoughts on career transitioning and the financial implications? Well, um, you have said a lot. But for me, I wanted to look at it, I like to look at it from the phase, there's a, particular, there's a particular phase, which I call the unemployment phase. And I'm um, speaking from experience, there's a lot that has to be considered when you're considering a career transition. Yeah. Um, how it affects you and your personal life. Mm -hmm. um, what are the, in order to actually transition, are there new courses and certifications that you have to take? And you have to do, will they be paid or unpaid? Will they be free? You have to consider the period whereby there's no income coming in. How many months are you going to be out of a job? 
and how are you going to survive um, when the benefits they are going to lose from your current job, depending on if you have, yeah. as against what you have where you're heading to or what you're looking forward to, um, how this transition is going to, or that phase is going to impact your your personal life in terms of how you spend money household-wise, yeah. your whole budget. You know, you have to cut down on a whole lot of things in order to survive that phase because you never know how long it'll take unless you already have a job before you're, you leave or before you know where you're headed. Yeah. You know, just even um, how much it will cost you from the new office to the old, or from your new, um, maybe your new location, your new office location mm. to your house, if you use public transport or if you drive, what it will cost budget-wise, if you have to relocate, whether you have to take a pay increase or decrease. So a lot of things to consider. And just like Uti, I'm also here with a pen and paper. Ready to <laughs> Although you seem like function. you already you have so much experience and then you can literally walk us through career transitioning as a matter of no, fact. It's just the unemployment phase that I can talk about because it's a lot. Uh, <laughs> okay, so maybe before uh, I come to you. So for me, right? Mm -hmm. I have actually experienced career transition big time, big time. I tell you. We so are. <laughs> we so are. first, right, I used to be a teacher and I did that for seven years and i became bored i because they were not accepting i'm a disruptive teacher right i'm not your regular classroom teacher and a lot of schools didn't under, don't understand that and they don't understand my style so i got very bored and fortunately at the time i got another job opportunity which was now outside completely outside education in real estate and then this person is saying to me oh you know what i've heard you speak come and do business development and i'm like Excuse me, I've been in the classroom for seven years. How, yes, I've had leadership roles and whatnot, but then how do I now transition into business development? But I'm like, oh, Hello? The, the pay is. Yeah, can you, can you hear us? Okay. The pay, the pay was like very, very, and we know how it is in Nigeria. Educators are not properly um, paid or compensated. Paid. So, so, this was more. so this was actually a whole lot more money for me and i'm like okay great opportunity it seems like there's going to be travel opportunities and whatnot as well you know what let's do this and that was how i transitioned into okay. business development and then real estate and all yeah. of that and even now so if i'm now in yeah, between yeah, yeah. again well yeah very very interesting i also can't wait to hear from our subject um, mm. expert tonight so mary let's hear from you um i think there's a lot to learn from this topic yeah <laughs> Um, I have so many questions, um, but what I'm also learning is that it's almost an undefined path. Mm. You can't really say. It takes a bold step to go into it. Change is very difficult. For me, change is very difficult. I find it hard to adapt to change, any sort of change. You know, there's a new person in the office, and <laughs> I'm just, I just want to be by myself. You know, I just want to be in my lane. Mm. You know, so changing careers as well, it takes, it, it brings out that decision maker in you yeah. because you're going to have to know what you want. Mm -hmm. And everybody's going to be on your matter like you really have to know what you want. Sometimes you actually don't know what you <laughs> no, want. You just figure things out on the path, you know. But there's the Gen Z nature, which I'm in the era of. We want to literally try everything. Yeah. We want to try new things. We feel like, oh, this thing isn't working for me. Mm -hmm. And your parents who have stayed thousands of years or, you know, <laughs> on a job where because it's just status school because yeah. of that fear of mm -hmm. you know trying yeah, something new i just telling you looking at you like girl we think you're really crazy you mm -hmm. know so there's the financial implication now is where the millennials are also saying okay well you guys want to be free jumping around trying jobs and everything but we're still the ones funding your lifestyle most of your your parents you know you're still under your parents roof mm -hmm. you know you're not really ready mm -hmm. to take it up to say okay you know what 
you might be homeless or you have to actually plan you know your rent yes. and you know stuff like that yeah. you know but we gen z's we just want to actually just oh i want to try this out today today is candle making mm -hmm. tomorrow is another <laughs> thing you want to do and mm -hmm. and and which is actually also fine mm -hmm. i i, I in, in my life i've i've gone to make up school i paid for it myself mm -hmm. you know and my mom's like but you never practice this thing i'm like okay you know i'm tired of this we went to um, learn how to make candles together, which was, you know, the start of everything, yeah. which is beautiful. But I call them the connecting dots in my life. And I, I, I don't know where exactly I'm going. I don't know the destination, but I want to enjoy the process. If this is what I want to learn today, let me learn it. But, you know, I have questions on how to plan as well, you know, because the last um, unemployment phase took me by by i don't know by you. surprise it shocks me <laughs> you understand? so i mean if i'm going to do it again i'm going to be wiser this time mm. in terms of probably budget for like well, a year or yeah, something yeah. yeah so that's okay it. uh Gumi is the chief executive officer for the headset consulting which is a coaching and consulting firm specializing in commerce acceleration career coaching women empowerment facilitation and training on the african continent with presence in Nigeria, South Africa, Botswana, Kenya, United States of America, Rwanda, and affiliates in Namibia, Ganda, Ghana, and Uganda. She has coached in multinationals such as Google, ABSA, Investec Private Bank, Silica, FNB, Vodacom, and Anglo American. And tonight she's joining us virtually. Hi, for me. So great to have you in, the, well, not in the studio, but to have you on the show tonight. How are you doing? Good evening, good evening, ladies. It's good, good to be here. Yeah. Welcome. You're welcome. Okay, so let's get right into the conversation. My first question would be, I mean, we're talking about career transition and its financial implications, yeah? So how do you financially prepare for a career change or a career transitioning? So when you're talking about career transitions, you must be cognizant of the fact that there are two types of transitions. The first is voluntary. This is when you plan for it. It's completely up to you. You're deciding that, you know, like you mentioned, perhaps you've been a teacher for a long time, deciding it's not for me, and I want to transition into something else. That's a choice. So you can determine the time period. The second is involuntary, which is what we were talking about a little bit earlier, which is unemployment. It's when COVID hits, completely unexpected, and now you're forced from a survival perspective to then go into a career transition. And how we financially prepare for these two are a little bit different. So in looking at involuntary, it's tapping into what in essence is your emergency fund. So what we anticipate is when we get our salary, whether it is on a weekly wage, a monthly perspective, you should be putting away at least 10 to 30% of that salary for in case of emergency, which can in future help you obviously take care of your bills, maybe be utilized as seed money to transition into another career, help you perhaps with stu uh, studying if you have to. So that is in preparation for involuntary career transitions. If it is a voluntary career transition, then you're determining what is the time period. You're currently employed, you're wanting to do a career transition. Are you planning to do this in three years, in two years, in one year? What is the plan? I know for myself, I gave myself a 10 year period. So I went into corporate, realizing that in 10 years, I will then become an entrepreneur. So I had 10 years to put away my capital and make sure that my finances were in a space that I was ready. So it does depend on whether it's voluntary or involuntary, what your financial strategy is going to be. Mm. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Bumil. All right, Uti. Um, hi, Bumi. So I think that the, the first part of the, your first response sort of feeds nicely into my question. So you planned for 10 years, but did you have an amount? Was there a threshold? Was there, this is what it is? As soon as I hit this number, then I know that when I hit 10 years, I'm good. What should people be planning for when it comes to, because of course people's incomes are different. Mm -hmm. Is there a threshold? Yeah, so a number of things to consider there, um, Uti. So if we're looking at voluntary, 
if you're looking at your market, so in the space in South Africa, on average, it's gonna if you're looking for another job as opposed to entrepreneurship, your amount is going to be different. So in the job hunting process in the South African context, on average, it's going to take you six to eight months to find new employment. In Nigeria, it does tend to take you a little bit more because of how competitive the market is and how many people are also job hunting. So looking at the stats in Nigeria, it's going to take you anything between nine to 16 months to get a new job, which means you're looking at your expenses and saying, do I have a minimum? of 16 months worth of savings for me to be able to do that career transition. So you're looking, first of all, at your bills. The second thing you then have to consider is what is required for me to do my transition. So maybe you may have gotten into the market where your undergrad sufficed. You fast track five to 10 years where you're wanting to be the requirements substantially higher. So now you've got additional costs to consider. You might have to do training. You might have to go and do your master's. Um, you might have to go and do a completely different degree. Is that factored in your savings? So looking at that will then determine what that amount should be. That's from if you're looking from a job hunting perspective. If you're looking at being an entrepreneur, it's very difficult to determine that number because who knows how long it's going to take for your business to finally take off, break even, and turn a profit. So then you start looking at, okay, what are the trends within my particular industry? So I was doing, um, you know, I was going to the human capital, capital space, the coaching space, which is great because they're very low costs, but I did have to factor in the education and training costs, right? Uh, paying for Harvard was going to happen for itself, by itself. So I had to budget for all of that. Then I could say, okay, I'm giving my business three to four years in order to turn a profit. So I knew what my bills were, what my expenses were, potentially what the salaries I would have to pay. And that became the number I pursued in my tenure journey. So it is dependent on the industry. It is dependent on your current expenses. And it is determined on the trends that you anticipate. Of course, you can put the money away and then the unexpected happens, like COVID. Mm. Okay. Um, NJ. Oh, we thank you for that information. Um, initially, I spoke about the unemployment rates. Um, you said, uh, you just mentioned that in Nigeria, it will take an average of uh, about 9 to 16 months to to get another job or to be able to replace, um, to get something to do. So, um, I just wanted to find out what can and okay, hi, NJ. Okay, I think we lost. Hello. You. Okay, NJ, we can we can hear you now. We lost you for a bit. Okay, so I was asking that during what do you do to survive that period, that you know transitioning period? What do you what do, what are the things that you have to do? What are the things you have to cut down? What do you have to look into? Um, how do you survive that process? So I think the first step is taking a lifestyle audit, right? So if you're doing a lifestyle audit, you're taking a look at what do I currently spend money on? Rent, food, where am I buying my food? Where do I live? Can I perhaps lower my existing expenses in order to make sure that whatever I've got saved away, I can, I can actually cover and stretch to meet my goals. So that's the first thing to consider. So if you are currently living in a very expensive apartment, can you perhaps look at converting that apartment to also be an Airbnb and generate another form of revenue? Or do you have to move back home? So having a lifestyle audit is the first thing. The second thing is once you know that baseline, where can you reduce? What can you reduce in your lifestyle? The third is then to say, how can I diversify my revenue stream if my main, uh, you know, mainstream is, is drying up a little bit or it's not going to be as abundant as it used to be? So for me, it's looking at things that are potentially passive income. Do I have any assets that I can leverage? Um, do, do I have any skill set that I can use to tide me over in this period? So I know for me, for example, I, I, had, a I had an honors in finance. So consulting from a financial planning perspective, wasn't necessarily my passion. I was passionate about career coaching, but I could offer those services to mitigate me um, really reducing my lifestyle, really reducing on my costs and expenses. So that's the first thing to take a look at. Then you have to look at what's non-essential. 
So a lot of the time we think, oh, this is so important, I need to get it. And if it's not essential or it's not going to help in the generation of revenue, you might have to cut, cut that out. And then, of course, in looking at diversifying the income and looking at that side hustle, we have to be strategic. It's important that we don't only look at our geographic location. So if you're sitting in Lagos, Abuja, um, in Ikiti, wherever you're sitting, can you perhaps offer some consulting services to someone outside of the country? Are you looking at what people are doing in Kenya, what people do in South Africa? Could you potentially leverage the advantage of where you find yourself locally and export that to someone else in the world while it's tying you over during that involuntary phase or that voluntary phase. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. So if I hear you correctly, Bumi, you're saying, first things first, you need to do lifestyle audits, yeah? So you need mm -hmm. to be sure that, okay, this is what I have to survive on for the next few months, right? And then, I, meaning that I need to cut down on certain habits or certain expenses that I would usually incur when I was in my previous my previous job. Okay, nice. Thank you. Uh, Mary? I think my question will come from a point where it happens involuntary. So let's say um, you got another job before you left the first one which is also into a new um a new direction a new path you know um it's somewhat related to what you were doing you know but obviously it's new so there's also understanding from the company that you should be able to learn on the job and pick up a bit but then you get into the job and it's almost worse than what you were coming from which is an unforeseen circumstance and is i think is, is it gets bad you can't really stay there anymore so you're unprepared for the next phase which is the unemployed phase because you leave um would you rather have the person stay and still plan or um is it advisable to just up and leave so I think it does depend on what you mean by bad. So there are two types of negative workplaces. The first is when you're having a negative experience, where you might be frustrated with the culture, you don't get along with your boss, but it is manageable. And then there's the second, which is toxic, which has a direct impact on your phys phys physical health, a direct impact in your psychological health, health. So if we're not looking at a life or death situation due to employment, my first call to all my clients will always be take your life and run. If it's I'm frustrated for me, the way they do things here is so archaic. Um, I wish we could do things differently. Then for me, that's a learning opportunity. And for me, whatever you are in a space where you're frustrated, it's a reframing. So that's when you reach out to a career coach. You reach out to mentors and you say, help guide me through the season of my life. I would rather someone walk away healthily than someone run away because oh, it's just, it's hard and I don't like my boss. Those are two fundamentally different things. One is a learning opportunity. The other is a threat to life. So if it's a learning opportunity, learn the lesson. Because often when we say, oh, I've got a narcissistic boss or I'm, un I'm unhappy with the culture, what you're running away from will generally follow you. And you need to master that lesson and understand that the opportunity to learn from someone you particularly aren't fond of is the reality if you're going to run your own business one day. I'm always sitting with clients that aren't necessarily my favorite, but I've had to learn how to engage them, how to create a cordial relationship that is productive for both parties. But if it is a toxic work environment and your health is, is, is literally on the line, then of course, you look after yourself first and preserve your life and then you leave. So those are the two very different circumstances, hence my advice would be different on both of those, Mary. Mm, okay, I'm liking the angle this conversation is actually going to. But then let's take a short break and when we come back, we'll continue the conversation. See you shortly. Thank you for joining us. If you just tuned in, we're talking about this career transitioning and its financial applications with Vumim Sweli. Please let's say what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation, send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 0818038 You could also tweet at us at WayShowAfrica1 with the hashtag 
We sure. So for me, I was going to say, I, I hear most times when people say, oh, before you leave, or if you're planning to transition from a career, for example, if it is um, voluntary, like she has said, mm -hmm. you need to, you should usually maximize the benefits you currently have at your present uh, um, place, place, place or work, work, you know. So things like your HMO and, you know, things like that. Do me, what, what do you have to say about that? I'm sorry, please, can you repeat that? So I was saying that in some, sometimes people would say that if you are making a voluntary career transition, you should, um, in most cases, maximize the benefits you're getting at your current place of work. So I was saying okay. more light, yeah. That is critical. If you are having a, a strategy to leave, mm -hmm. use the resources given to you. And I think a lot of the time when we look at our careers or we look at our current employers, we don't see the advantage. Yeah. You are often with a brand that's recognized. That brand, when you walk into certain spaces, opens up doors for you. How are you leveraging that to increase your network? Um, something as simple as when you're at work, you don't have to pay for Wi-Fi. Um, how are you leveraging that to prepare for you to go? You want to utilize every single resource given to you to help catapult you to your next level in your career. That is what um, I think will give you that credibility. It's also, you know, being strategic. So if you know that you're going to be leaving, there's a career transition you're wanting to do. So let's say, for example, you're currently in finance and your career transition is fundamentally different and you wanted to get into marketing. Use your current employer. Spend time with the current marketing team. Understand the lay of the land. Learn from them, the experts of what they do. So by the time you pivot to your next career transition, you've utilized what has been given to you previously. Every organization I've worked for, I've learned from. So when I was at Barclays, I learned a lot that helped catapult me to Vodafone, which helped catapult me into my own business. Every career transition, every single organization gives you an opportunity to walk away with something. Yeah. Often when we think about career contracts, we only think about, oh, they give me remuneration, for my energy and money and um, time spent, my intellectual property. What we don't realize is that it's both a give and take outside of just the finances. It's the resources, it's the network, it's the exposure, it's the experience. Leverage every single thing to catapult you to, no to your next career transition space. Mm. Okay, um, NJ. NJ, you are going to say something. Mm. Please go ahead. Oh. Yes. Um, well, for me, I would, I, I have, she said, Obama said that we should use every resources within the uh, current working space. Um, I, I used to think that you would, it would give you, for me, I used to feel guilty using it because you know your, your way out. Mm -hmm. So you feel like, oh, now you're using their resources to either do meetings and try and, you know, send out CV and do all this, um, you know, job search online and all that. So for me, I felt guilty at the time, you know, using those resources. But Rumi is just, um, you know, putting it to us that it's actually your right to actually use those resources because that is part of the benefits of working without work environment because most times we don't use all these things and all these resources and then you're leaving, you find out that you haven't used your leave and you haven't used certain things. So and sometimes you that's why I said you feel guilty that you now want to use maybe you have 15 days leave left mm -hmm. and then you take that time off and then you come back and you turn in your letter. So yeah, it's it's it, it, it's a bit much, but um, well, now I know. So looking forward to the next, you know, transition, career Indeed, transition. Can I say something that you, that I always say, and my clients always, it's, it's jarring for them. Your first loyalty is to the CEO that is you. Mm. Your employer enjoys the benefits of you. So your loyalty and your prioritization must always be you. Once you are able to admit that and align with that, then you are able to serve your clients accordingly, be that your employer, because your employer will change. If it is um, 
if it's your business, then your clients will change. But if you are able to always keep loyalty to you first, it's very, very easy to know when to prioritize and who to prioritize when. Because you will walk away having not leveraged what was freely given access to, and your competitor next door would have done so. Then you wake up five years down the line and say, how come they're further down the line than me? You simply did not take advantage of the opportunities presented to you. Hmm. I like that. Cause, so I'll use myself as an example again. Where I used up my... <laughs> I made sure I went to the dentist. I made sure. <laughs> the first time, no, I had a goal. Trust me, I you know I I really because I was like, really, I didn't have time to you know do a couple of those things. But the minute time, I'm like, wait, I've got here for how long? And then I haven't. No, mm. I have to you know leverage on my my benefits. And I may try maximize it to the last. And I'm very happy that <laughs> I'm very happy that I did. I would also want to add to what um Vumi said about um creating a budget right okay. so you know i remember we're having this conversation i think on wednesday with jennifer yeah. and we're saying oh you know plan i, I think that's just the big i wish I, I knew that at some point in my life that things might not just remain the same you know things <laughs> things are going to change so that's alfredo pasta that you always go to eat on sunday afternoons you know it's that not gonna happen for anymore. now it's not gonna happen i can't you know i can't mm. leave i can't splurge as much as i will normally do because i'm currently going through a, a phase right okay um let's see let's hear your thoughts yeah i mean no jokes right i sent my pen and paper it's scribbling all the way um but thank you so much um for me my question really sits around the cultural um viewpoint yeah, that we have in nigeria that you know everyone who's working it's almost like this thing where you know, being an, being an entrepreneur is the thing, right? Why are you working for someone? You should have your own business. Mm -hmm. So when, you, when we think about the voluntary side of transitioning, and maybe even sometimes involuntary, that, that pivots people into those kinds of situations. But um, more on the voluntary side, what, when people think about career transitioning, what should be the signs? What should I be looking out for to say, you know, perhaps... Um, the time is right for a transition because I think a lot of people just don't realize that it's an option. Um, so, so what are those signs that our viewers can look out for? So, in looking at some of the signs when you're ready for career transition, most of the time, if you've got a side hustle or you've got a side business, that's an easy one for me because then you're saying, "Is my is my current revenue for my side business superseding one my expenses?" Has it been consistent and has it now matched or superseded what I would be earning as a salary? So that for me is the first tick to say, okay, financially, as, an, as a, as a part-time entrepreneur, I think I'm ready. Then you look at the benefits. What are the benefits of me leaving my current, my current employer? Would the revenue double, triple? What would that look like? And for me, I always want to say you want to test this a little bit. So if you are currently only doing your, your side business on a Friday to, to Saturday, resting on Sunday, then say, okay, what happens if I started also doing it after hours during the week and adding those hours and seeing if there is revenue increase in that? That's a good indicator to say it might be ready for me to take this full time. Mm. If you are a little bit nervous, then you say, can I potentially hire someone to grow the business whilst I'm still employed? And if it starts growing, okay, I can take over this full time. So those are some of the signs you can take a look at. The second is if there is no um, side business that you're doing, but you're finding yourself in the space where you're bored, you're frustrated, and you're ready for the next challenge. And you're now saying, I actually need uh, to transition. So for me, the things you need to be considering there is one, what would an engaged workspace look like for me? Um, what what kind of stimulation am I looking for? And is the stimulation something that I need to get for my work? Or is this a stimulation I can get from outside of work? I know for myself, when I find that little itch and need to perhaps leave an organization because I'm bored, I can do this with my eyes closed, I'm not feeling challenged, I usually pick up a degree. I'm like, let me take my time after hours to mentally stimulate myself. But if I'm noticing that even with additional studies, going to work is now a drag, mm. And I'm really frustrated. I'm having the conversation with my employer. 
then for me, I know it's time for me to transition. And I think often we are afraid of transitioning, not realizing that prior to COVID, we anticipate that the average human being working is going to have a minimum of eight career transitions in their lifetime. So it's something you're going to do at least eight times. So the moment you're able to say, hmm, I think I'm ready, I need that transition, then you ask yourself, why? Why do I need the transition and what is it that I'm looking for? Sometimes we'll find that we're looking for more meaning, more purpose in life. You know, as we as we climb up Maslow's hierarchy of needs, our need even from a work perspective changes, right? The first time it's all physiological. We're just trying to make sure we're taking care of our bills. The roof of my head is the food on the table. Awesome. Then it gets a little bit more. Then you're like, actually, I want psychological safety. Why, why do I not feel safe in this environment? I'm kind of scared of my boss. I need more than this. Then as you transition, you see yourself getting to the C-suites. It becomes about legacy, right? And self-actualization. So understanding where you are and what you need is will also help guide you when you're ready for that change. And if you can't supplement that change with other things in your life, so when I was looking for purpose, I started um, volunteering to teach and it subsided that need to career transition for a good year because I was now exp exploring and expressing that need in another faculty in my life. So looking at all those signs and looking at holistically, I think for me are good indicators when you're ready for that next career transition. Okay, thank you very much. Um... Really, I was I was also going to say, what would you say to people who are experiencing some sort of, would I say fear? Fear is holding them back because it's, I would call it the fear of the uncertain. So they are not sure what it is that they are supposed to go into. They are not ready. So some people might even have the financial ability to sustain themselves. Like you said, in Nigeria, you should usually give yourself between nine to sixteen months. So some people might have been able to save up enough money, you know. But then there's still some sort of fear that is holding them back. What would you say to such people? The reality is that if you are going to do anything and it's unknown, you're going to be afraid. And for me to wait for fear to subside, you'll be waiting for eternity. I don't know one entrepreneur who went full time and said, oh, what a pleasure. It was so easy and it went everything went according to plan. It just doesn't exist. Even if you're changing careers, when I changed from the financial services sector to the telecommunications sector, there was great fear. I was comfortable there. Going into something that is not comfortable is going to be scary. So for me, um, courage is not um, is not the absence of fear. Courage is doing it afraid. So you have to be able to determine for myself, for yourself, what am I afraid of? What can I do to circumvent the very worst of this happening? Am I comfortable with what I've put in place to mitigate that risk? And then working within myself to say, I'm willing to do it afraid. Okay. All right. Mary? Um, I don't know how to phrase this question per se, but it is, you mentioned something about learning. Um, I know sometimes we're quick to say, oh, this is hard. And so you just want to jump out and leave. But in the in the in the process of in in that process where you're learning, and is it's like there's no guidance to what you're learning through. You might be trying to learn, but the environment is actually toxic to your mental health. But you don't want to seem or sound cliche because you know it's going to seem like oh yeah, some things are meant to toughen you up. Um, so I would like to say how, I don't know, I don't know how to phrase questions. Will I say how do you learn or how do you learn through the process or how do you know when to say, okay, this is a learning point and this is actually affecting me? Because in that learning process, sometimes it feels like, okay, just endure for a bit. You actually endure, you actually pick up some strengths from the situation. But the same scenario keeps playing itself over and over and over again in the company. And you're just trying to say, oh, I know I'm supposed to learn something, you know, from this, but it's actually taking a toll on my mental health. It's like I'm drowning and I'm seeing myself drown and I do not know how to, you know, pick yourself, pick yourself up. up. Or you pick yourself up from something and you think that, you know, and you're falling back into the same thing, you know, because... I've been through um, leaving a job and going back to the job 
because there's 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 a bit of passion in which I actually like something there, but there are a whole lot of things that outweigh that mm -hmm. passion that I have for the job, you know. So it's like you think, oh, okay, I can do this again. I think I'm stronger this time, and then you go back in, but then it's the same, you know, mental phrase, you know, you're going through. So, um, what would be your advice for survival? So for me, in the learning phase, it's about you've learned something and mastered something when there is no longer an internal impact on you, right? So I recall having a very narcissistic boss. And every time she would walk into the room, I'd get ready to literally pass out. And until I had built the mental fortitude and spoken to my coach and worked with my mentor to get to the point where even though she continued her behavior, Mentally, I created a sacred space where she couldn't impact me. Mm. I didn't burst out crying anymore. I wouldn't get home and die of frustration. Um, I got to the point where I was starting to make notes and say, she is this kind of leader. And as this kind of leader, what can I learn? Because even bad leaders teach us what not to do. And as I mastered her not having any control between my internal in my internal um, compass and the conversation I was having with myself, then I was ready to leave. Because for me, it, I was no longer running away from the situation. I was walking away from what no longer served me. And I think there's a difference. One is an escape where we don't master the lesson, which means at some point in our life, I truly believe the lesson will come back. And if we haven't mastered it, we'll have to master it a little bit later. But also in knowing that this is now toxic. And when it's toxic, it goes back to what I said earlier, where it's becoming a mental, psychological life or death. I'm getting suicidal. I can't get out of bed. I'm falling into a depression. Then you can't learn if you're in a space of survival. If you're in survival, you're in self-preservation mode. So you need to then be comfortable to say, I cannot learn in this environment. I have to look after my health first. So I think those two, for me, are the, the, different, the differences. But in that learning process, you study the environment, you study the person from an objective perspective, which is hard because you are experiencing it. But you can't study and be subjective. Um, it's, like a, it's like an exam in high school. You can't say, oh, this is my experience um, with biology. You have to say, this is objective, this is how the rules work. And once you're able to understand, comprehend, and thrive from an objective perspective, then you're able, for me, to be comfortable in saying, I've learned the lesson. If I were to meet another person, version 2.0 of this, I would quickly master the environment. I would quickly master the boss because I've learned and I've been able to pivot and turn around what was, in essence, meant for my harm to actually um, be what can be the trajectory for, for me thriving in the future. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mimini. Very well said. Ladies, any final words? NJ Uti, any final words? I, I think we've just learned so much. Um, and just the idea that people need to think about career transitioning as an option. I think too many people just don't think about it. Um, so really, if, if it's the right thing for you, um, and there's just a plethora of options. I think that one of the things that we also don't process enough of is how many actual careers or options there are out there. Mm. I think some our scope can be limited by our experience or by our environment. But I mean, really, there are... I mean, I know this is, you know, maybe the 1%, but I mean, there are people who get paid to travel, there are people who get paid to watch TV, there are people who get paid to taste food. So, I mean, there is just so much out there um, that is interesting. So if you don't like what you're doing, I think my my mantra is if you're, you're not a tree. So if you don't like what you're doing, move. Mm, I like that. You're not a tree. You can actually move. You're not immobile. Hmm. Nice. Thank you so much, Uti. NJ, final words? Um, you have your comment, Uti. Um, from everything Rumi has said and all the ladies, all the contributions, um, it's very, very important for us to understand where we are. And if there's, first of all, do an analysis to be sure that a change is required or a transition is required. 
um, be able to know what you require for that transition process and be able to plan for it ahead of time and for us not to allow any form of fear um, to, to be the motivation for our transition. I think we've learned a lot and I have my notepad filled with a whole lot of um, you know, thoughts. So I would I just want to say thank you for me for the time and for all the knowledge and insights you have given this evening. Yeah. I must say it was quite an enlightening conversation and I learned quite a number of things as well. Thank you so much, Bumi. It was great to have you on the show again. And we also look forward to having you some other time. Before we go, do ensure you follow us on Instagram at Show Africa. You can interact with us further, drop a comment, and most importantly, follow all our social media engagements. And remember to like, share, comment, and invite your friends and family to watch us and follow us. If you missed today's quote, here it is again. Your career is like a garden. It can hold an assortment of life's energy that yields a bounty for you. You do not need to grow just one thing in your garden. You can you do not need to do just one thing in your career as well. And this is by Jennifer Richie Poet. See you on Monday at 8 p.m. as we bring another great conversation to your screen. Thank you so much, ladies. <laughs>